Uh, do you remember when the right wing freaked out about Bud Light? I mean, they really freaked out about Bud Light. They were shooting Bud Light cans. Uh, the right was very, very, very upset about Bud Light. They were so mad. In Florida, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis got so excited about it, he ordered an official Florida state investigation into Bud Light. In Congress, House Republicans started their own federal congressional investigation of Bud Light. They have spent the better part of the past year on this. No longer would everyone in the country see Bud Light as the beer that is slightly more flavorful than Coors Light, but not quite as flavorful as Miller Light. But the Bud Light blue is kind of a pretty color, and sometimes it's on sale, so sometimes you buy it even if you're not in love with it, because no one's really in love with it. And hey, if you're drinking light beer, no one expects to be in love with that stuff anyway. I mean, that's how we all used to think of Bud Light, admit it. But after nearly a year of right-wing, culture war, no-holds-barred demagoguery against Bud Light, no longer would any self-respecting right-winger, would any self-respecting Republican buy Bud Light because it was on the end cap and came with a free koozie. No, over the course of just under a year, Bud Light was transformed from a normal American thing you don't think much about into something very, very bad, something they would shoot on sight. Former President Donald Trump, of course, jumped on board. Money does talk. Anheuser-Busch now understands that, he said, in, in a post promoting right-wing boycotts of, of companies that were seen to be liberal or liberal-seeming, or maybe if you squinted, they might feel a little liberal, but you're not sure why. Bud Light, over the course of this past year, became a conservative target, became a Trump world boogeyman. Until... Donald Trump did a total 180. Out of the blue, he decided unilaterally to call off the right-wing Jeremiah against Bud Light. He told all his followers to start drinking Bud Light again. Quote, Anheuser-Busch is a great American brand that deserves a second chance. Now, what caused this radical U-turn? What caused the former president to turn on a dime like this? The word dime is a help in this question. Because if you put that Trump post back up there, the one where he says everybody should go back to drinking Bud Light, look at the, the time and date stamp on that one. Can we actually just make that part of it a little bigger? You can see the stamp. Yeah, there we go. All right. So keep that in mind. 3.30 p.m. on February 6th. Why is that when Trump did his 180 degree U-turn on Bud Light? Well, hmm. Look what happened that same day. Lobbyist for Anheuser-Busch announces $10,000 a plate fundraiser for Donald Trump. So at 9.47 a.m., the lobbyist for Anheuser-Busch announces a $10,000 a plate fundraiser for Trump, 9.47 a.m. <laughs> that same day at 3.30 p.m., Trump announces that he has changed his mind on Bud Light and conservatives should all drink Bud Light again. That fundraiser was announced on February 6th. Uh, it was actually held last week, Wednesday last week. But, you know, all Anheuser-Busch had to do was announce they were going to do the fundraiser to get Trump to do what they wanted, to get Trump to call off what had been a years-long conservative culture war top-line issue. Would you like the head of the Republican Party and the Republican Party's next nominee to be president of the United States to do something for you? Would you, is there something you would like him to do for you or your company? Perhaps you would consider opening your checkbook and swiveling your wrist. Because that's apparently what it took to end the great right-wing Bud Light freakout of 2023 and 2024. One fundraiser. That's how that one sort of ended in fiasco. But now behold, here comes the same process again. Last week, end of last week, something happened in Washington that almost never happens anymore. There was a vote in Congress. Uh, this was an actual policy, and it's even on a somewhat controversial issue. Nevertheless, the vote on this bill last week in Congress was 50 to nothing. Now, this bill is on the issue of TikTok, the social media app. And whatever you think of TikTok, or whether you think of TikTok at all, <laughs> there have been bipartisan concerns um, that have been expressed for a long time that this very popular social media app could pose a national security threat in the United States because of links between the company that owns TikTok and the Chinese government. 
Um, I say there are widespread concerns about this. These have been manifest already in policy at lots of different levels. Already, if you are a federal government employee or contractor, if for work you have a phone or another device that belongs to the federal government, the federal government says you are not allowed to install TikTok on that device. In more than 30 states, there are similar bans on installing TikTok on any device that belongs to the state government. This bill that's racing through Congress would require app stores to remove TikTok. So you can't download the app anymore. The, contingent, the, the only contingency would be if, if the company was sold to a firm that didn't have links to the Chinese government, that didn't have links to Beijing. Barring the company that runs TikTok being sold, TikTok would effectively be off the market. When Trump was president in the summer of 2020, he tried to ban TikTok unilaterally himself. He tried to force the company to be sold. He issued an executive order banning any American citizen from having any transaction with the company that owns TikTok, which effectively would have banned the use of TikTok by anyone in the United States. He tried that. He did that in the summer of 2020. That executive order was eventually struck down by the courts, which is why TikTok is not banned right now. But Trump was very clear on this. He made a huge issue out of TikTok being evil and bad and dangerous. It had to be stopped. He was going to stop it. That was his stand. Until. Until something happened. Until, do we have that? Do we have that cash register sound? Did you guys find it? <laughs> oh, suddenly he's just made a total U-turn. I wonder why. Um, after, after personally trying to ban TikTok, after railing against it and playing Mr. Tough Guy against TikTok for years now, trying to shut down this app in the United States, Trump has just come out and said, actually, we shouldn't get rid of TikTok. That would be terrible. TikTok's actually got a lot going for it. He said so online on Thursday, and now today he said it in an interview on CNBC. There are a lot of people on TikTok that love it. There are a lot of young kids on TikTok who, who will go crazy without it. There are a lot of uh, users. There's, you know, a lot of good. <laughs> it's a lot of good. Really? All of a sudden, why the change? Quote, some have noted that Trump recently hosted Jeff Yass at his Mar-a-Lago club in Florida. Yass is a billionaire investor in ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, and Trump is seeking his support in the presidential race. So follow the bouncing coin, if you will. Step one, take very aggressive, very public position against foreign company. Step two, notice nearby man. <laughs> who has a $33 billion, 15% stake in that company. Step three, need money desperately. Step four, announce new stance very much in favor of the same foreign company you used to oppose while blinking one's eyelashes at the man you just noticed. Step five, ka-ching, cash in. If you would like the head of the Republican Party and the Republican Party's next nominee to be president of the United States to do something for you or your company, open checkbook, swivel wrist. Anything is possible. And if you don't believe me, take it from Trump's own folks. This is the headline in Newsweek right now. Quote, Steve Bannon suggests Donald Trump has been bought. Steve Bannon, former advisor to Donald Trump, suggested on Saturday that the former president was paid off after a shift in his stance on TikTok. When even Steve Bannon is like, whoo, this guy appears to be for sale. Steve Bannon right now has been sentenced to prison for a massive... <laughs> Steve Bannon has been sentenced to prison and is out of prison while his appeal is pending, Steve Bannon has been put up on charges, had to be pardoned by Trump for an alleged massive fraud scheme. Steve Bannon is going to be charged for that mass alleged massive fraud scheme in New York state court. And Steve Bannon is like, whew, seems a little transactional. I don't know. <laughs> this guy appears to be for sale. If Steve Bannon is saying you appear to be a little fraudy, a little for sale, a little transactional, that means you have ceased to be subtle about it. 
There is a lot that is going on in Republican politics right now, which is not the way things usually go in politics. There's a lot of overlap between, like, crime and politics, prison and politics. But as Politico.com reports tonight on the, quote, bloodbath at the RNC, with Trump's people finally taking over as of this weekend, and now as of today, they are firing dozens of people who work at the Republican National Committee, with confirmation that there is no longer even an effort to stop the, national, the Republican National Committee from paying Trump's personal legal expenses out of the Republican Party coffers. We are in a place where the entire Republican Party apparatus is merging with Trump's personal legal defense apparatus. And the way he has been behaving when it comes to being transactional at his time of most desperate financial need puts us, no matter how you think of Trump, no matter whether you support him or not, no matter whether you care about politics or not, it puts us, the American people, in a radically fragile place when it comes to what exactly is for sale in our country and from our government. I mean, Bud Light and TikTok seem to have figured out very early on where exactly you insert the coins to receive your prize. But, but if anything is for sale, right, if, if everything is for sale, what makes you think it's going to stop with thin beer and Chinese social media apps? Everything must go. Everything's for sale. Anybody who can pay can get what they want. And you wonder why guys like this always want to undermine the rule of law, right? On Friday, Donald Trump had to put up cash and collateral for a $91 million bond in the New York case in which he was found liable for repeatedly defaming E. Jean Carroll by making what the court concluded were false claims that he had not sexually assaulted her. Two weeks from today, he will have to put up cash and collateral for a bond that is closer to half a billion dollars in the case where his real estate business was found to have engaged in years and years of fraud. And we've been looking at that. I think the frame on that has been that this is a difficult and dangerous time for Donald Trump right now. But because of the position that he's in, that makes this a difficult and dangerous thing for us as a country right now. Because he's got to put up bonds for over $500 million worth of court judgments right now within the next two weeks. He's put up already just under $100 million of that, still another $400 plus million to go very soon. He does not appear to have the cash and assets and collateral to pay for those bonds, to put up what he needs to put up for those bonds without considerable strain, if he even can cobble anything together to bolster those bonds in total. So he desperately needs money. I mean, right now. That bond, the half billion dollar bond, that's two weeks from today. And he needs that money so urgently right now while he is openly changing his publicly held, long held, supposedly heartfelt policy position, positions in ways that appear to be just straight up responsiveness to financial incentives. On the bond he paid already and the huge one he's got to put up for within the next two weeks, there is no public transparency into who might be co-signing with him or otherwise underwriting these bonds. Somebody helping him put up the cash and collateral for these bonds? If so, what are they getting in exchange for their generosity to him? I mean, we know the name of the bonding company that put up the $91 million bond for the E.G. Carroll case, but we don't know if it was Trump alone or Trump and some helpers who put up the cash and collateral necessary to obtain that bond from that company. We have asked Mr. Trump this evening if he will tell us if there were co-signers or anyone otherwise assisting him in obtaining that bond. We have not yet heard back from him. We will let you know if we do. But in national security terms... This is a profoundly dangerous thing, regardless of what it means for him personally and politically. It's a dangerous thing for us as a country. I mean, think about if, if you needed to get a security clearance for work, right? You wanted to get a security clearance. But when you applied for that clearance, the FBI did their background check on you, and they became aware that you were in this much need of this much money this urgently. If you were applying for a security 
clearance right now. And the FBI found that two weeks from today, you need to put up cash and collateral, collateral to secure almost a half billion dollars of a bond to pay your court judgments. Do you think you would get a security clearance? There is no chance you would ever be approved for even the lowest level security clearance because the risk is just too obvious that you would be tempted to sell American secrets for this money that you so desperately need. Whether or not you were known to be a particularly transactional kind of person, there's no way that wouldn't be seen as a massive national security risk. Last week, Politico was first to report that Trump is about to start receiving classified intelligence briefings again. Presidential candidates, major party nominees always get these, at least they have historically. But no one's ever received a classified briefing as a presidential candidate while he or she was awaiting trial in federal court on multiple felony charges of violating the Espionage Act by deliberately mishandling classified material. And no, no one's ever received those kinds of briefings while they, quick, need to come up with a half billion dollars worth of cash and collateral to put up bonds to pay their court judgments. In the days after Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was killed in an Arctic prison in Russia, a Russian website that was made to look like a news outlet posted what it claimed was a leaked audio recording of two high-level U.S. State Department officials discussing who should replace Navalny as leader of the Russian opposition. The implication, of course, was that there's no real Russian opposition to Vladimir Putin, that anybody in Russia who's opposed to Putin must be part of an American front, must be part of what is, in effect, a U.S. government creation. Like, Navalny wasn't a real resistance leader. He wasn't a real opposition figure. He was just a tool of the American government, and they'd pick a new one to replace him now. This supposedly leaked audio was so obviously fake, it would fool exactly no one. A State Department official told the Daily Beast, which broke the story, quote, in, the ca in case the thick Russian accents pretending to be U.S. officials were not clear, yes, we can confirm this audio is fake. But still, it doesn't have to appear to be all that real. You launder it, right? You, you say it's been cited here. You describe it here. You move it into another fake news site here. I mean, the, the Russians successfully got this idea into circulation. For a time, if you searched the names of the people in this story, the U.S. government officials who were named as the supposed you know, source of this leaked audio in the story, the, the hoax audio came up as results number two and number three on Google. And if you clicked through to the quote unquote news story, you would be taken to this site, the Miami Chronicle, which at first glance might appear to be an actual Florida news site. At one point, it featured the tagline, Florida News since 1937. But this chronicle has existed for less than a month and it's created by Russians. So is this very similar looking one, not the famous New York Daily News, but instead the New York News Daily. Also, here's another one, the Chicago Chronicle. That sounds like it could be a real paper. It's not. Or this one, the DC Weekly. All of these different sites have the same mix of AI-generated stories on right-wing hot-button issues like crime and immigration, plus a whole slew of stories advancing the Kremlin line on the war in Ukraine. Not long ago, the DC Weekly site posted an entirely made up story about Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, spending tens of millions of dollars on a pair of yachts, yachts for himself. The story was total bullpucky, but it's perfectly designed to spread on social media as if it were from some real news site, which it is not. At least one Republican member of Congress and one Republican senator then cited the fake yachts as a reason to oppose uh, approving any more funding for Ukraine. It's Republican Senator J.D. Vance, Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. And while that's hilarious about them, in all seriousness, Ukraine funding is still being blocked by Republicans in Congress. These very obvious Russian fake news sites are proliferating right now. And again, they are not sophisticated. You spend just a few seconds on one of these sites and you quickly realize this is not, say, a newspaper that has been bringing you Florida news since 1937. But these efforts do not have to be sophisticated to spread disinformation effectively. You just launder it. 
You just spread it around. You say you've seen it somewhere else. You get, you get the government to comment on it. If you can just get it into the bloodstream, if you can just lend a sort of aura of credibility to posts flying by in any social media feed, mission accomplished.